Passover meals are going to be Friday night in the life groups. If you've never done this before, it'll be, it's fun. And what you're going to do is recreate the meal kind of that the Jews celebrated at Passover. And we know Christ came as our Passover lamb, so we're going to get together, study that, walk through the meal, and figure out what it means as you do that. So that'll be fun. If you're not in a life group, but you would like to, again, you would like to attend one of the Seder meals, just on your card, fill out, say, I want to go to a Seder meal. I want to be a part of that. Write it on your card. Drop it in the offering agape boxes out there, and, and we will take care of that. We'll get you plugged in. I got I to gotta say something I don't usually say. I got to thank God for making provision for our church. You know that? God has provided through your tithes and offerings. He has provided all of our needs. It helps us support missionaries. It helps us support needy people in our church and in our community. And because you give, we are able to do those things. So thank you for doing that, and thank you, God, for providing uh, through God's people. So I don't usually say that, but I wanted to say it this morning. Thank you to God. Thank you for, for all that you do, for how you serve, and how you give. That makes our church what it is. All right, so today we're going to study Palm Sunday. Now, this is going to be kind of an interactive sermon. Who wants to hold a palm branch and wave it around? Who will not hurt someone? Who's, res who's responsible enough not to wave it and put someone's eye out? Joan, I don't... Are you sure? I'm kidding. <laughs> Miss Joan is going to kick me after the service. So we have some palm. Hey, Jason, why don't you put some of these out? All right. Let's just do a little interactive service. Anyone else want to wave a palm branch? Hey, I need someone else. Here we go. Yeah. And the, anyone else? Andrew looks like a palm waver. How about these guys? On, anyone? Here we go. We know that out, you know the people that grab the palms, they're all the extroverts. They're all the ones who want to be the life of the party. If I wasn't preaching, you know I'd be holding one too. And it's a fan. Yes, you fan the people around you. So Palm Sunday, it's a great day. Ah oh, man, what a great celebration. This is Easter week. This is the Passion Week. This is what the Christian lives for. I mean, as much as I love Christmas and I love the virgin birth of Christ, he came as a virgin. Why? To come and die on the cross. The Passion Week. So it's all started on Palm Sunday. Now, when I say palms, if your arm gets tired, you can put it down. But when I say palm, I want you to wave it, okay? Or Hosanna. Palm or Hosanna are your, okay, those are your hot words. I want you to wave it when I say that, okay? All right. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Now, this is kind of a weird sermon title for me, but it's what, so, what Palm Sunday reveals about Christ. Yay, okay, so you're paying attention. What Palm Sunday reveals about Christ. All right? Because that was my question as I was thinking about this week's sermon. I mean, what is it all about? What's the significance of Palm Sunday? There you go. Very good. You get A pluses. And so I want to create a background. Before I even get to my sermon, I just want to create a little bit of a background of what was going on before we get to that. So Jesus had just been teaching in Jericho. And the time of the Passover was coming about. So Jesus traveled about 20 miles from Jericho, which is about 1,000 feet below sea level, all the way up to Jerusalem, which is 2,000 feet above sea level. So 3,000 feet he traveled up, 20 miles, 
with his disciples. I want you to get this picture. I mean, this is wilderness, desert, rock. And the pathway, the Jericho pathway that he's on, is about as wide as a doorway in your house. I mean, it's right there off the cliff. They don't care about safety <laughs> out in Jerusalem. There are no guardrails, even to this day. I mean, it's a two or three hundred foot drop to the bottom. There's no guardrails. There's no safety. But can you imagine Jesus in close proximity leading his disciples, leading the ladies who had followed them around through this wilderness, this treacherous trail, all the way up to and it comes out from the south. It comes out by Bethany, by the Mount of Olives. So there's Jesus and his companions walking 20 miles. And when they get there, it is Sunday. Now, what is Sunday at Passover? Sunday at Passover was Lamb Selection Day. You get that? Back in Exodus 12, you on Sunday were to choose a lamb for sacrifice. That lamb was to be without defect. It couldn't have a broken leg. It couldn't have jacked up teeth. It couldn't have like an oozing eye. It had to be perfect in every way. So it was Lamb Selection Sunday. So here comes Jesus walking into town with his disciples up to the Mount of Olives. Now, since it was Sunday, imagine Jerusalem. It's kind of a bustling city. All the happenings, all these pilgrims coming in to Jerusalem to, to celebrate the Passover. And they had this messianic expectation that the Messiah would come and he would lead them to victory over the Romans. And he would set up God's kingdom on earth. So here's our Lord. Coming into town. On Palm Sunday. Yay. Good job. Let's pick the story up in verse 28. When he had said this, Jesus, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, the Mount of Olives, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go to the village opposite you, Whereas you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? You shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. Now, could you imagine being just one of those two disciples? Hey, I want you to go over here to Cibolo, and there's a donkey. You're going to find it off 11.03. And I want you to grab that donkey. And I want you to bring him here. But it's okay. The farmer's going to let you have it. Now you're thinking, well, this is Texas. You just don't grab a... That's, that's a shooting offense. <laughs> a man in Texas has been shot for a lot less than a mule. But God sends him on ahead, doesn't he? Now it's going to take some faith of these disciples to do this. But having faith, singing, hey, we just saw the Lord bring Lazarus back to life. All right? I think I can go and loose a, a donkey from a farmer's post. Verse 32. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But, they, but as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it, said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. And they brought and and then then they brought him to Jesus. Now, other gospel presentations of this event, 
They say, hey, the Lord needs it, and he'll send it back when he's done with it. So it wasn't like Jesus was going to take it and have it forever. He borrowed it and sent it back. Now, that's the interesting point there. See, Jesus has all understanding of what's going on around him. He has prophetic insight and power over what's going on. He knew what was going to happen. He sent his disciples to, to get the donkey, and it happened. Don't you think in our own lives that when God sends us on a little errand, don't you think God's got it taken care of? Don't you think he has the provisions in place to take care of us? Don't you think when he sends Miss Velma out, that he has, he has it prepared exactly what she needs? He's going to meet her needs. He's sending her out. He knows what's going to happen. He knows the plans he has for her. And he's going to take care of her. And he's going to see it through. Verse 37. No, excuse me. Verse 34. And they said, The Lord has need of him. And then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. Now, what's the significance of that? What's the significance of Christ sitting on a colt or a donkey? Well, in the Old Testament, the Jews knew the sign of a colt was a sign of kings. In the book of Judges, there were 30 kings and their sons rode on 30 donkeys. Okay? When Solomon... When David was dying and Solomon was going to be king, David said, go get a colt. And Solomon shall ride in and they shall say, long live King Solomon. He was riding on a colt. And so they has very significant biblical picture. A colt was the ride of kings. So Jesus, the king, riding on this colt. And they said, um, Now, then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their, again, their own clothes on his colt, and they set Jesus on him. And again, it was a colt that had never been ridden before. But Jesus, again, showing his power over the elements. Remember the storm on the Sea of Galilee? They're, you know, the waves are crashing and the disciples are freaking out. And where's Jesus? He's sleeping. They're like, Jesus, wake up. Are you not, a, are, are you not concerned that we're going to die? And Jesus stood up and what did he say? Peace be still. And at once the storm subsided and the lake went to glass. Jesus Christ has power over the elements. He has power over the, the animals. This Cold had never been ridden, and yet Christ sits upon him, and he submits to Christ's authority. Who's smarter, the human or the cult? <laughs> the cult submits to Christ's authority, but as humans, a lot of times, we are cratch, scratching and clawing our way to obey the God of the universe. Yet the cult submits at once. Now, and other, we turn over to Matthew. Okay. I said Matthew. I meant Mark. Sorry. All right. Uh, Mark 11. 
verse 6. This goes into a little bit more detail. As they spoke, uh, Mark eleven six. I hear Bibles rattling. Mark eleven six, And they spoke to them, just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it and sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road. And others cut down leafy branches, palm branches, right, from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save now. Save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He's, the disciples here are quoting from Psalms 118, a messianic psalm. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. See, this is all very, as, we, as a Westerner, we read this, and we may skip some of the significance of the pictures here. We have Christ riding on a colt, which was the ride of kings, right? And we have the palm branches. Now you say, what's the, that's right, what's the deal with palm branches? Why is that significant? Well, it was the Hebrew symbolism for freedom. When Julius Maccabees and his brothers had a rebellion against the Greeks and they drove them out and they had freedom from their captives, what did they make as their symbol of freedom? But the palm branch. And so when Jesus is coming in to Jerusalem, he's going out of Mount of the Olives and they have the coats on the colt and Jesus is riding down and they're throwing down their clothes and their palm branches and they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, save now. They are instituting Christ and they want him to be Messiah, King of Israel. And so, as they are shouting this, the Pharisees and those in control are getting a little frightened because the last thing they need is a rebellion. Because the Romans, they have known of the Jews' insurrections in the past and they would come in and they would squash them. And they're afraid, the Jewish leaders are afraid that calling Jesus Messiah, calling Hosanna, save now, Hosanna was not a religious term as we see it now. It was a political cry for freedom. The people, the Jews, were looking for an earthly Messiah king. Flip back over to Luke 19. Now, you can go to the next slide. That's kind of the background. Now, as I look at this, I was asking myself, what's the significance of Palm Sunday? What's the lesson for me in our church this morning? First of all, I see two things. Through Palm Sunday, I see, thank you, right? Christ, heart for the Father. All right? And what's going on? I see Christ's heart for the Father, and here's why. Okay? Since the beginning, I'm not even talking about Jesus' virgin birth. I'm not even talking about the creation of the earth. From whenever eternity passed, when God had this idea of humanity, he knew sin and salvation. God chose a plan, a will, a way, to save man. Ephesians 1 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Don't you think if Christ, before the foundation of the world, he chose us, don't you think he knew that he would have to die for us? From the beginning, Jesus Christ has had a heart to please the Father. I said last week, Christianity is more about what God has done for us than what we do for God. 
Let me tell you why. Jesus Christ was eternal. He didn't have a body. He let go of all eternity to take the form of a man 2,000 years ago and for eternity future to be holding to this one body. You get the significance of that? I once preached a sermon where I said, if God wants to know the significance, if he wants to have the human experience, it would be like us. You know, if my daughter Ava had a fish tank and she wanted to love her fish, the best way for her to love that fish would be to become a fish and swim around in the tank with them, right? But here's the thing. That was not just a one-time deal. She'd have to be a fish for all of eternity. Would you give up your humanity to become a fish forever? Would you submit yourself to torture for that fish? To die for that fish if you knew you could save the fish? No. And that's a crude example compared to the greatness of Christ. He left heaven, became the form of a man to remain in human form and even a glorified body forever. That's what God has done for us. Now, John 15, 5. Uh, excuse me, John 5, 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, here, listen to this. The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Jesus doing what the Father does. Jesus doing what the Father set out for him. That is to what? To be our sacrificial lamb. To be our savior. So in this Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday, I see it as a picture of God's heart. The son's heart to obey the Father and fulfill the mission by which he came. Okay, next. Now, I see also Christ's heart for you. Christ's heart for me. Listen to this. Verse 37. Now, he, as he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude and the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice and all the mighty works they kept saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered and said to them, I tell you, that if they should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. At this point, Jesus announcing he was the Messiah. At this point, God the Father choosing the sacrificial lamb for our sins, the Passover lamb. Now, it's interesting that the sheep who were sacrificed on Passover came from Bethlehem. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. It's not a coincidence. It all adds up. It's giving me goosebumps as I think about it. This isn't something made up by man. It is God ordained, God predestined. And when they would, they would raise the sheep in Bethlehem and they would bring them into Jerusalem on lamb, Sunday. What route do you think they took? The same route that Jesus Christ took on Palm Sunday. These lambs would come to the temple to be slaughtered for the sins of their people. Jesus Christ came the same way. And he came through the sheep gate. 
just as the lambs came through the sheep gate to be slaughtered. So Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, coming through the sheep gate. I get an amen. 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 It's not coincidence. Now, they were looking for this Messiah. Verse 41. Now, as he drew near, they saw the city, and they, and what did he do? He wept over it. Jesus Christ weeping over this city and for the people. There's only three times in Scripture when we see Jesus Christ weeping. The first is at the death of Lazarus. And when Mary was crying, we see Jesus crying. He felt their pain. He felt their hurts. And he cried for them. I want this to be a takeaway from you. No matter what you're going through, no matter what hurt you feel, no matter what emotional problems or pain you're going through, Jesus Christ, I guarantee you, weeps for you. And he weeps with you. That's how much God loves you. His heart is broken when your heart is broken. So we have Jesus weeping at the broken heart of Mary and the death of Lazarus. Later in John, we have Jesus weeping in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he's about to be arrested, to be crucified, we see him weeping and sweating uh, drops of blood. Uh, he's in such pain, the capillaries in his forehead are bursting in blood. Instead of sweating sweat, he sweats blood out of his forehead. That's for you and for me. And then here we have Jesus on Palm Sunday. All the excitement, all the messianic fervor, all of the, all of the hopes that Jesus would be the Messiah to deliver us and to break the bondage of Rome. Yeah! Yeah! Out of all that fervor. And the disciples, they're quoting the messianic psalm, 118. And what does Jesus do? He weeps over those people. Now I assume he may have been weeping because they didn't have a relationship with him. They were not saved. I guess that could be part of it. But I feel, I feel that he's weeping because they're rejecting him as the Lamb of God. Verse 42. If you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. The only way to have peace with God is by this, the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. They rejected Jesus as Messiah, as the Lamb of God. They wanted peace through arms. They wanted peace through re rebellion. But that's not why Jesus came. Verse 43. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. They rejected Jesus as Messiah. They made Christ into something he wasn't. That's a danger. Do you make God, do you make Christ into something he's not from Scripture? Do you bend yourself and believe and follow the, the God who is? 
Or do you look at Scripture and do you bind and bend Christ into what you want him to be? And that seems like that's a danger in religion. That's a danger in our culture. We reject the Lamb of God just like the Hebrews did and we make Christ into something he is not. That's a danger. That's a false Christ that only leads to destruction. So just as Jesus foresaw that the, the owners of the cult would let him go, Jesus foresaw this choice they're making. They're rejecting the peace and love of God for a false peace and imitation. Don't be satisfied with the imitation of Christ. Okay? Only be satisfied with the real deal, buddy. This chance is my boy. So I had a moment. Okay? Don't be satisfied with imitation. Boom. All right? So, just as Jesus is right about everything else, he's right about this. In AD 68, the Jews have another rebellion. They reject the way of peace by the blood of Christ, and they took up arms in rebellion once again against the Roman Empire. What happens? Titus comes down. They interlock Jerusalem. I think, if I remember correctly, it took them two or three years to break through the wall. And once they did, they went in and they killed anywhere from 600,000 to a million Jews because they rejected Christ as the Lamb of God. How would the story have ended if they would have chosen the way of the Lamb of God, the love of God, the blood of Christ? 600,000 Jews following the resurrected Christ. What would the world look like? But instead of that, they chose the way of their own thinking, their own desires, and imitation Messiahs. To me, when I look at Palm Sunday... I realize two things for me, and I hope that you can see this too. One, Christ's love and obedience to his mission and to the Father to die as a sacrificial lamb for your sins and for my sins. I hope that impacts you and you realize how much Christ loves you. And the second thing is to realize that Christ weeps for you. He hurts when you hurt and he has a heart to go to the cross and to save you. My question to you this morning, are you willing to follow the Messiah who is the Lamb of God? 30 years ago, I decided on my knees, crying out, I would follow the Messiah who was the Lamb of God. I would trust in him. Is as real as I'm standing here today. And I figure every day since then, I get up in the morning and I say yes all over again to Jesus Christ. I'm trusting in you right now just as I did when I was 13. It's fresh and new every day. And this is my... This is my also my request to use if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ that you would make him your Messiah the Lamb of God you know he died and shed that blood as the penalty for our sins for the wages of sin is death the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and we need Christ we if we would just trust in him, if we would just believe in Christ. It says nothing about doing good works. There's not enough that you can do. There's not enough Bible you can read. There's not enough money you can give away to, to have righteousness. It's only by believing in Christ. 
If you're a Christian, share that message with everyone you can. If you're a Christian, live in that, man, that great place of joy, knowing that I'm saved and forgiven. And if you're here and you know it, if you've never received Christ as your Messiah, I would pray that today you would do that. So let's bow our heads. It's not usually my style, but hey, I just feel prompted by the Lord, the Holy Spirit. Hey, if you're here right now and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity right now to, uh, to be saved. I don't want you to walk out of here not knowing where you stand with God. And if I were sitting with you in your front room of your house, I would just ask you right now, if you want to be saved, if you want to be forgiven, that you would just call out to God right now and just admit to him, yes, Lord, I have sinned against you. I've broken your commandments. And Father, I turn from those sins. I turn my back on my way of life. I hate my sin. I hate my past. And right now, I receive you as my king. Come into my life to be my Lord and forgive me of my sins. I trust you in your death and resurrection. Amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer and you, man, you prayed that, you repented, you trusted Christ, you're born again. Today is your birthday. Come and see me after the service. I got a Bible for you. I got all kinds of cool stuff I want to talk to you about. So, I love you guys. All right. One more thing before we're done. Um, Palm Sun Friday, Good Friday. Hey, there you go. You guys are still listening. Good Friday. I guess that's it. Love you guys. Have a great week. And uh, we'll see you next time.